Good day and welcome to the AWS Partner Summit. My name is Sandra Woods and I am a Senior Partner Marketing Manager with Amazon Web Services. I'm so delighted that you chose to join me for the How to Deliver Effective Customer Workshops and Webinars Virtually Breakout Session. During the next 30 minutes, I will review AWS best practices for how to plan, build, and deliver impactful and repeatable technical workshops, webinars, and trainings in a virtual world. Over my many years in the IT industry, I've planned, executed, and delivered hundreds of virtual events to customers and partners. My AWS colleagues collectively will deliver thousands of events virtually uh, this year alone. Through my professional experience, feedback from audience participants, and watching my colleagues, I've gained a set of best practices that I hope will be useful to you. So why is this important? Uh, you have limited time with your customers and educating them can be challenging, especially with the shift to virtual. The difficulty becomes exponential. However, the upside is that through virtual events, you have the opportunity to quickly get your message across. Now keep in mind, if your customers do not find your information relevant during the virtual session, they'll simply disconnect. So you wanna grab their attention and keep it. Additionally, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to get potential customers to attend. So make sure that the effort that you've put in um, definitely is worth it um, you know, in completing that. So now we'll cover the do's and the don'ts for design and planning of your virtual events. First, know your audience, know the personas of the audience and tailor the lesson to them. Uh, a message to a technical person versus to an executive is going to be very different. A technical person um, you know, may want to do a deep dive and an executive might want high level benefits for their organization. Try crafting a message for each of them, uh, trying to craft a message for each of them and trying to appeal to them is nearly impossible. So you need to decide on which role type that you're going to target and then craft a message directly for that audience. Do focus on use cases and customer success stories. Include use cases on how your product or service uniquely solves customer problems. Regarding customer success stories, People remember stories very well. Stories help people associate the information with the information uh, you are sharing. So raw information with nothing to associate it with will be hard to remember. The goal of your event is for people to remember and retain information that you've shared. Do have a learning objective. What will you learn? Um, you know, here's an example of a learning objective for a training with, uh, say, Amazon Transcribe. Uh, you will learn how to transcribe MP3 audio. Using Amazon Transcribe, you can take common audio formats and accurately transcribe low and high fidelity audio. This service helps improve the accuracy of transcriptions. So this is a, a learning objective that you can include in your invite and in your know before you go. Um, again, so you can let your audience know what it is that they will get out of that session. Do make it fun and engaging. Let's face it, people want to be entertained. Studies show that people learn better when they find the information fun. Participants have many distractions that uh, you'll have to compete with. Here's a tip. Treat your virtual attendees as if you're having a conversation and they're in the same room. Use polls and then talk about those poll results. One of my colleagues would um, ask questions and call the names of the attendees who posted the answer. Um, he started to get more responses, which meant the people were listening. Also consider having um, two speakers, and then, because that kind of you know, differs the tonality um, of the event, and it just kind of breaks it up a little bit. Plan for specific sizes um, of the workshop. Um, a good ratio for participants with assistance is one to 10, and one to 12. 
for webinars that have a hands-on component, it's one to 20 to one to 30. This may seem like a lot, but you want to be able to answer questions as you are presenting instead of waiting to the very end. Also for the upper limit of a workshop, no more than 140 is better, but even less than 20 is ideal. Large workshops make it very difficult um, to deal with technology challenges. Do have prerequisites and homework. Uh, send prereqs, prereqs out prior to the start of the event. This is like uh, signups or anything that you need the participant to do ahead of the workshop. Not everyone is going to do their homework, just like you know regular class, but the ones that do will help limit the number of people who need help during the actual event. Do leave time for questions. Sometimes information is you know, just not cl always clear. Leaving questions to the, the end may not allow enough time to answer everything that your participants have. Also have seed questions. You may have a shy audience and seed questions help spark the audience to join in. Questions are also a good opportunity to receive feedback for improving your content. So definitely make time for them. So don't make it a how-to guide. There is plenty of information on the internet of how to install and configure something. So don't waste valuable time on showing your audience how to. Instead, spend time showing um, your audience your solution and how it's solving a specific use case. Uh, the why uh, to using your solution or service is more important than how to use it. And of course, don't disparage the competition. Don't waste time on feature comparisons. Focus on your solution or your service and how it solves the customer's problems. Customers may or may, or may not even be aware of your competitor's features or functionality. Now that we have discussed the do's and the don'ts of design planning, let's transition to building the content for your virtual event. All right, do create an intro slide deck. Give visuals for the early birds to do or to see. Um, here's an example of a slideshow that has a few pictures from cities around the world. Uh, you can also show maybe photos of your company's last um, event or something that you feel comfortable sharing. I've participated in virtual events where random trivia questions are put up on the screen to focus everyone's attention until the session, uh, session gets started. Do annotate the meeting platform. Icons are good, but they can also be very confusing. Annotate the different icons, which also directs them to where you want them to be. So here is, um, so here is uh, this example. So if you look towards the bottom of this screen, right-hand side, there's a little box with an arrow going to the outside. I struggled, I struggled even with this one. It, Act, it's actually screen share. At first, this you know didn't make you know sense to me. Icons are not always treated equally and could mean different things to different people. So please do annotate when possible. Don't create busy slides. Busy slides are the ones with too much information, too many words, charts, images, etc. Attendees end up paying attention to what's on the slide instead of paying attention to actually what the speaker is saying. This is very distracting for the participants. My recommendation is to keep it simple. Otherwise, you will lose the attention of your attendees. Again, you have limited time with your audience, so keep distractions to a minimum. Do automate the irrelevant. So you don't waste time, valuable time, on non-learning objective things. Automate and consolidate steps that don't support what you want your audience to learn. At AWS, we use an event platform that's called Event Engine to help our field teams run workshops, game days, and boot camps, and other events that require hands-on access to AWS accounts. Event Engine uh, allows you to have cloud formation uh, templates that pre-populate resources before attendees actually sit down and ready to go uh, through the workshop or event. Limit the amount of copy and paste that you have. 
Too much copying and pasting re really reduce learning opportunities. Have your participants do manual typing, uh, probably editing stuff, um, even having them click through a different UI uh, components. This breaks up the amount of copying and pasting that you're having the participants do. Also reduce sign-up fatigue. Sign-up forms can be long. You can send out an email validation pen uh, to mobile device. Uh, you want to keep it simple. Participants are already asked to do a lot. You want to limit the amount of information that attendees have to put in. Also note, many corporations actually strip email attachments or they strip email links. If you send out an email validation as part of the sign-up, Note that some participants may not even get it. So work with your marketing teams to make sure that they've put together a text and an HTML email invite and a no before you go. Do create architecture diagrams. This helps people visualize and gain context around what they're going to build. Uh, diagrams also help as a learning aid. Use them. Um, break your content up into modules and sections and pages. This allows participants to accomplish small portions and creates natural breaks. Modules should be no more than two hours long. Sections should be no more than 30 minutes and no more than two pages when you scroll. And then do provide on-demand content. Not everyone gets through the content from the virtual event. Uh, we have people who actually will watch the event and then go back to the on-demand content to actually do the work um, of the uh, particular session. And then also this gives um, you an opportunity to send people to the on-demand content when you have reached your capacity for your event. Now in this section, we're going to cover the do's and the don'ts of workshop delivery. Do provide something for early attendees. You'll have uh, those that arrive early and they'll want to check their uh, voice, their video or, and their audio uh, to make sure that everything is working. Uh, give them something to do or give them something to watch. Earlier, I mentioned about showing photos or having um, questionnaires or um, trivia questions. Uh, in this example, uh, this is a whiteboard that uh, we've used in one of our game days. And notice how people just kind of doodle on it, you know, saying hi or different things about AWS. It creates a bit of engagement with people and it gives them something to do while they wait. It also, it's, it's, a, it's a very good icebreaker as well. Go with the delivery style that works best for you. Here at AWS, we have found two methods that work really well. Uh, one is instructor-led, and this is where an instructor actually goes through each and every step while participants watch, and they do the steps on their own. The second is a lab or game day style. This is where you probably um, provide a little bit of information to the participants, and then they go at their own pace, but you're still providing assistance online. So if they have problems or they end up with issues, the participants can ask for help. Don't overstay your welcome. This is super important. Keep workshops and game days under two hours. Webinars should be no more than 30 minutes. If you go beyond this, you're going to have significant drop off. Here at AWS, we've noticed that if a workshop or an event goes beyond two hours, you potentially lose about half of your attendees. Word to the wise, don't overstay your welcome. Don't play a recording or music. This is just a, a bandwidth issue. Everyone's internet will be very different. If you need to share something, consider using a link or using a streaming service. Do start with platform instructions. Don't just jump straight into the workshop. Cover how to use the platform, how to raise your hand or ask questions or even chat. Do set the tone for smaller workshops and game days. Introduce yourself and the staff. Provide maybe your name, maybe you know where you live, uh, possibly how long you've been with the company. Um, this makes it a little bit more personal. Uh, plus, provide answers to common questions like, "Will this be recorded? Uh, will the deck be provided?" You can. I can always always 
someone will always post this question in the chat. Uh, but you know, so give the answer ahead of time. What to expect? Uh, learning objectives, break times. What do I do? Um, you know, this is a question. What do I do when um, I have a question? You know, let your attendees know that. So put yourself in the participant seat. What would you want to know? And then, you know, provide that information um, in the beginning as well as during the course of the event. Do build in breaks. Two hours is extremely long. So building in breaks for restroom uh, breaks or getting a drink of water, maybe even getting up and stretching. If participants get back early, ask a question such as, what was the last thing that you purchased on Amazon.com? Or what's your favorite vacationing spot? This drives relationship building and helps people feel more comfortable. Do use a participant-friendly platform. Don't try and use a tool that wasn't designed for. Uh, webinar platforms uh, tend to miss useful tools for workshops, such as screen sharing and breakout rooms, uh, just to name a few. Workshop platforms tend to miss tools for large webinars, such as the ability to mute everybody. Platforms we've had great success with is Blackboard and Zoom for workshops, Zoom and GoToWebinar for webinars. Do your research, find what works for you, and look at the features and functionalities that you need for your event. Do go slow. Instructors are very familiar with the information, so they tend to go fast, even when they think they're going slow. So slow down and explain and describe where you're at on the screen. For instance, um, I'm just giving an example of you know, the instructions that you can give to your attendees. Go to the left-hand side, click on the file button, drop down to the menu, click on that. Describe each and every step and no matter how slow you go, go even slower. Do prepare for the worst. Uh, you know, we don't want unfortunate things to happen, but we have to be prepared. What if the internet drops for the speaker? Do you have someone available who would um, pick up right where the person left off? Um, also, the instructor of the workshop, you know, they're multitasking. Uh, they're trying to lead the workshop. They're trying to, you know, watch for participant questions. They're trying to do multiple things. So it's very easy to misstep. So here's a pro tip that I really um, love that, you know, was provided by one of my colleagues, especially because I like watching uh, cooking shows. So treat your audience as if um, they were on a baking show. So on a baking show, um, the, you know, the, um, the chef is, you know, mixing the ingredients and putting the ingredients of the cake in a pan and then putting it into an oven. And then um, they'll open the oven, put it in, but then they'll pull out an already baked cake. Obviously the you know, it didn't take, you know, a few seconds to bake a cake, but they were prepared. It's like they took it step by step. So treat your workshop the same way. Um, have, you know, sections already prepared. So if something does go wrong, um, you're able to handle that. So now let's recap all the tips that we went through. We went through a lot. So starting with design and planning, know your audience. So make your, um, your message about a specific persona. Focus on use cases, have learning objectives, and don't make it a how-to guide. Explain why the solution is best to solve their, your customer's particular problem. Don't make it about competitors. Nothing good comes from that. Make it fun and engaging. Participants will retain the information better if you include a customer success story. Stories help people attach what they've learned to memory. Workshops should be no more than 40 people, but no more than 100. And then have participants do uh, prerequisites uh, or some homework prior to that. Building content. Have something for early participants like um, a slideshow or a whiteboard. Um, you know, annotate the platform such as what to do um, when you click, chat, or ask a question. Provide screenshots um, and deep links. Uh, automate parts not related to the learning objectives. Leave out busy slides. You want people to pay attention to you and not reading the screen. Limit, copy, and paste. 
reduce sign-up fatigue, use architecture diagrams as this enhances the learning, use modules to break up your content, and give people small bite-sized accomplishments, and then provide on-demand uh, content. Now for delivering, give early participants something to do um, as the whiteboard example that I provided. Use either instructor-led or game day style. Uh, you can try others, but these two have worked very well um, here um, at AWS for myself as well as my AWS colleagues. Um, keep workshops less than two hours, webinars no less than 30 minutes, uh, provide platform instructions, provide info upfront to common questions such as, will the session be recorded or will the deck um, be shared? Build in breaks every 45 minutes to one hour and then use, the pla use a platform that provides event specific features. Um, don't play music or videos, but if you need to just you know, send a link um, and then use um, or use a streaming service. So now my final thoughts, uh, virtual events are a great way to connect with your customers and educate them on the value you can bring to their business. Whether it's a workshop, webinar, or bootcamp, it, if done efficiently and correctly, it can yield huge benefits for your company and your customers. I hope you found these best practices useful as you prepare for your next virtual event. I can't wait to attend. So before we end, I wanted to mention a new competency here called the AWS Digital Workplace Competency. AWS competency holders are partners that have been validated to deliver solutions that help AWS customers with their digital workplace needs. I encourage anyone looking for a digital workplace solution to check out our digital workplace competency partners, or if you're a partner that has a digital workplace solution, please look into applying for this um, particular competency. Something else I'd like to mention, the AWS Business Professional Pathway. Expand your cloud knowledge with free AWS partner training, specifically designed to help you support your customers. AWS training and certification offers both digital and classroom training, so you choose to learn best practices either online um, at your own pace or from an AWS instructor. Learn at uh, http uh, colon forward slash forward slash aws dot amazon dot com forward slash partners slash training. Once again, thank you for attending the session. And please don't forget to complete the session survey. Have a great rest of day.